You're watching Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected on the Paranormal Channel. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some work to do. Is this thing on? Am I back? Am I actually back? Can you guys see me this time? Am I here? Who is that? Finally. Who is that? <laughs> Looks familiar. Sounds it's been, familiar. It's only been two weeks, guys. Give me a break. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Dead or Paranormal. Uh, resurrected right here on the Paranormal Channel. It is Friday night at 9 p.m., and we thank you guys for joining us. Uh, our regular people in the chat, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we've got a fantastic show tonight, and we're looking forward to uh, two hours of great uh, conversation, the best, actually, para paranormal conversation that's out there right now. Michael and Rosalind Lewis will be joining us here in the first hour. Matt Rosvalli will be joining us in the second hour, who is a producer and actor. And uh, we've got some great, great topics to bring up for both of them. Don't remember to hit that, but don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Also, click on the bell as a reminder. For any upcoming events that are going on, uh, click the like button, the thumbs up. And uh, you guys that are in the chat are always welcome to comment uh, and ask questions from our guests and for ourselves. And those that are going to be listening to it post-show, the comment section below. We always look forward to your comments and suggestions. So I am grateful, grateful, grateful to be back. Yeah, last week, power uh, was fine. Just had a problem with, and I, I won't tell you what the... Uh, service that i have but it rhymes with bay t and t um, and i lost cable internet phone everything and it was down for nearly 12 hours 14 hours so uh i, I missed you guys i missed andrea for last week but uh, ken mike you guys did a phenomenal job uh holding down the fort i appreciate that thank you it didn't come easy yeah missed you <laughs> didn't come easy well, we're all back together, the three angry old men, and uh, let's get started with our show tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to Ken right here to introduce our, our first guest, and uh, boy, I, I all i got to say to uh, Rosalind is butter pecan pie. That's all it is. So I'll turn it over to you, Ken. Go ahead. Hey, before we start, I want to take a quick shout out to David Grady, our friend who's in chat. Dave is recovering from knee surgery, and he's joining Ooh. us here tonight. Ooh. Wow. And uh, knee replacement surgery. Actually. Knee replacement. So, yeah. So, David, thank you for being here as usual. Yeah. And happy trails to you. Get well soon, my friend. Good luck, Dave. And now on to our guest. She is a former cast member of Sci-Fi's Ghost Hunters Academy. She has a background in psychiatric nursing and special education. She is also a Reiki master, an angel therapy practitioner, and a psychic medium. He has been a member of several philosophical and paranormal groups over the past 30 years and experienced in ghost communication, meditation, spiritual healing, and angel card readings. He's currently honing his craft as a singer and a songwriter. We hope to talk a little bit about that tonight. So without further ado, please welcome our friends, Michael and Rosalind Lewis to the show. Hello, hello. Oh, welcome, guys. Little, there we are. Hi, how's everyone doing? We're doing absolutely fine. Suppose it's been a long time, so suppose you tell us how you folks have been holding up through all this madness going on. Um, we've been doing pretty well. Um, you know, we've been with safe. We've mostly been at home since March because um, we both live in New York State. So, of course, that was, you know, the early hardest hit um, state. So things got locked down pretty securely here. And, you know, Michael has the luxury of being able to work from home mostly. So, you know, we've just kept things contained. And, you know, my son and I have, you know, asthma. So we have to be very careful. We don't want to take any unnecessary risks. So, yeah, we've just been home and safe and looking forward to getting back out there and, and seeing everyone again. Well, I mean, right. please continue to do so. Whatever's working for you, just keep it up. I think that... Uh, We've talked about this before, where if we happen to have a reboot of this, I'm hoping up here in the Northeast that uh, we've learned a valuable lesson and we know how to mitigate this a little bit better. So God bless. Good luck. Stay healthy. And I'm glad to uh, glad to have you both here tonight. 
Thank you. Uh, I want to dive right into this right now uh, because an hour blows by pretty fast. Um, in the field of paranormal study, both of you have chosen a path of light and positivity, um, you know, beyond your obvious character because you were both very, very positive people and you share a message of light and goodness. And those of us who have had the pleasure of meeting both of you know that about you. But um, was there ever a conscious decision when you decided to pursue this together that you said, you know, hey, here's the path we wanna take. Here's where we wanna go with this and sort of do something a little bit different that frankly, a lot of times you don't get to see from people that are uh, that are doing this. Well, I think for me, you know, it's twofold. Number one, I have the luxury of having married someone who is just without any spiritual or psychic or paranormal stuff. He's just a natural healer and caregiver. I mean, that's his personality is to to look and check in with others and make sure they're okay before he worries about himself. So, you know, I, I, I was lucky to, to marry someone like that. And secondly, you know, I come from a background as a paranormal investigator that, um, you know, we were part of a group that would often get some of the darker um, negative cases. And we had a subset of our group who would specifically handle those. And I was part of that subset. So I've had this, this background in dealing with the darker side of things. Um, from an aspect of trying to help people, not from trying to glorify it or thrill seek or anything like that. It was, you know, genuinely just helping people in private homes deal with some disruptive things. So for me, there's no thrill in the dark stuff. Um, and helping people is always paramount. So, so right. gravitating towards the light, realizing that like attracts like, that raising your vibration um, can cause positive things to happen for you and for others. You know, I do prefer to stay towards those positive things and, and trying to help others. You know, I think as well, um, when you when someone first um, pursues paranormal um, explorations, it's kind of natural to maybe have that thrill seeker aspect, you know, to want something to happen, to want the meters to go bonkers to come out with a, right. an amazing EVP. And, um, you know, that is, it's, you know, it's an allure and, you know, it can be uh, also a component to um, research and documentation. You know, however, I think that we both feel that um, if, what's out there is some element, um, has some type of personality, be it human or otherwise, then what we're really engaging in in a, an occasion of paranormal exploration is really an, a relationship. And um, it feels sometimes a little bit exploitive to just show up someplace for two, three hours and say, hey, come and make my meters go bonkers and come and leave me some cool EVPs. And then I'm out the door. I know you may have been here for a couple hundred years, but yeah, I'm really just about the, the next two, three hours. So, you know, come and entertain me. Um, so I think that um, we're really um, try to, to keep in mind um, that there may be a give and take that there may be a, uh, how can we help you even when you're, um, you know, at an investigation or at a haunted location? Sure, so I sure. think that's, that's something that mm -hmm. we, that we really both vibe on. Yeah. Ken. Yeah. I yeah, mean, you so, touched so, something so, there that for the longest time I've always, I've always emphasized is that if we're reaching across for spirit communication, they're not there for our entertainment pleasure. And I understand sometimes we make suggestions how we can communicate. Maybe it's through something vocal. Maybe it's through sounds. I understand all of that. But sometimes I think we get a little too deep into the, you know, move this, touch that, make this sound, et cetera, and so forth. 
Um, so I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that I wanted to ask you folks, because you mentioned it, Michael, do you think that there is perhaps a little, maybe too much of uh, an over-reliance on gadgetry and technology and gizmos at the expense of exploring the human condition? You know, um, we both tend to be fairly low tech, you know, um, we don't own a lot of the, uh, the gear. Um, and you know, if there's a, a situation, um, a group setting, uh, maybe, um, it's nice to, you know, have a little bit of everything perhaps at a, at a site, but, um, you know, I think that, and, Roz uh, definitely always advocates this, that, um, you know, your first spiritual connections happen without that stuff. They happen, you know, with your, your, your clairaudience or your clairvoyance, you know, your clairsentience, your claircognizance, you know, you'll, you'll get little whispers, little bits of information. We all have something in us that connects to the spiritual realm. And so to uh, place a trust in that, to, um, to uh, develop that, I think is a very valuable thing. And the other stuff, if it's there and can supplement or maybe can pinpoint some things, you know, um, maybe a, a, a spirit box giving you um, certain words or phrases uh, to, to focus on or you know, gender, like, you know, who's here tonight and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, as well, just do we need that the whole time? Um, you know, there's occasions where, um, and you've, you've had an EVP, you, you usually have your tape recorder mm -hmm. running the whole time. And you've had some interesting things when your guys were so-called not investigating yet, right? Oh, yeah. And like during the breaks in between now, the group that I was a part of, when I was part of a large group, um, you know, probably like most groups, you do a private home, you might be there for three hours, you break up into a couple of teams, you rotate every hour to a different floor, a different area. And, and then we would usually have a break maybe after the second hour. And during that little 15, 20 minute break, you know, everyone's relaxed, you're having a little coffee, a snack before you go back to it. I keep my voice recorder running the entire time. And I would often catch an EVP during that time. Um, or also during, we had a, one of my favorite EVPs, um, I had done a, it was this historic mansion um, because I'm from South Jersey, right outside of Philly. This historic mansion right there on the Delaware River um, that nowadays is used for, you know, big events and weddings and whatnot. And we were doing the initial tour. So we hadn't even started the tour. We had just gotten there. We're getting our gear out to do the walkthrough with the the woman that was, was running the, um, you know, posting us for the investigation. And I got what this great EVP of what seems to be two different voices. Uh, one sounds like it's saying, do you see people? And the other sounds like it says no. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's like one of my favorite bits of evidence um, because you know, number one, it happened when we weren't, you know, make something move, make a noise, knock on the door, et cetera. It happened organically. Um, but also to me, it sounds like there's two spirits. They're aware of each other, but one can see us and one can't. So to me, I thought that was one of the coolest things, but you know, so you can get great things with the tech, but it wasn't the hyper focus on it. It, it just right, sort of right. happened because right, we were right. behaving normally and they were reacting and responding to us. I think one of the things that we always have to be mindful of is that the people who bring these claims and these incidents to us typically aren't ghost hunting. They're just going about their everyday business. They're not yes. waving recorders around or meters or anything like that. They're just going about their daily lives and they have an unusual occurrence. So putting yourself in that same position and adopting that sometimes less is more type of attitude can be beneficial. Um, before I turn it over to Michael, and yeah, if you have questions for Michael and Rosalind in chat, please sing them out. Uh, before we get to Joseph's, um, I wanted to ask you about fear because 
we touched on it briefly. And I like to talk to people about this type of thing because fear itself can be a great motivator. Um, it can be used as a control mechanism to exert dependence on someone. And a lot of people sadly go into these places introducing fear as a means of controlling the subjects. In other words, you must do what I say to get out of this thing. Mm. Um, it's kind of the dirty little secret of the paranormal and not something I embrace at all. Um, I'm curious how you feel about that approach, particularly, um, you know, when we see it on TV because fear sells. I mean, let's 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 be real here. Um, or especially, I guess, when it's practiced in real life by people who maybe are trying to imitate art and what they see. So, you know, what are your feelings on that? Well, I think when people behave like that, it number one stems from a complete lack of compassion. Um, they seem to be forgetting or choosing to ignore that. Number one, of course, we all accept that we don't really know what a ghost is. But if it is what most of us assume is that it's the disembodied spirit or entity or consciousness of a formerly living human, right. then let's remember that it's a formerly living human. Thank you know, this you. is a person. So to use them as some sort of prop or entertainment or, you know, to, to threaten or bully them in the afterlife, I don't see how that's any better than mistreating and threatening and bullying people um, on this side. Uh, do you have any input on that? Yeah, it just, I don't know. It, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel genuine. And so it's not something that, right. um, that I, I, I could, could endorse. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it's, it's, it is, uh, unfortunate that I, I, you know, as you were saying, you know, maybe it's displayed a certain way, you know, in some paranormal entertainment, um, you know, a way of, amping things up or getting results or which we uh, remember, remember is, is exactly, exactly what it is entertaining. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. And as such, I, I think it's really helped to open up the field a lot more and to uh, create a public interest um, and maybe even an acceptance that uh, wasn't there 20, 30 years ago. But mm -hmm. yeah, if, um, it just doesn't doesn't feel right to try to force something or to try to bring um, this heightened negative emotion. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, absolutely. George, if you'd like to, we can get Joseph's question back up there. Joseph Reza asks, what was one of your more intense investigations and how did it turn out? So my, probably the one that was the worst um, actually started out very innocuously. It was an invest. oh goodness, it might've been 15 years ago. Um, I did an investigation in Pennsylvania, um, probably just like Northeast or yeah, Northeast of Philly. And it was a small home, just a husband and wife, no kids. They had a bunch of cats and they lived in this little house and they really seemed like this ideal couple, um, to the point that when I left the first investigation, I remember thinking, wow, you know, I wish I'd had it together when I was their age. They're this young couple, they've got plans for their future, they they seem happy and united. And you know, it took me 30 years, 40 years to figure figure my life out. So that the investigation was really unremarkable. It was me and two other people because it was just a very small house. And after we left, one of the things that my group would did, and kind of like what Michael was referring to earlier, we didn't just come in investigate and leave, we would actually set up a contact person who was there that night. So one of the investigators who was there would be assigned as your contact person for the homeowner. Mm -hmm. And that person would then contact that person. We'd contact the homeowners in 48 hours, in two weeks, and then every two weeks until we return to them with our written report and any evidence that we captured. So I was assigned the contact person, contacted them in 48 hours. How are things going? Has there been any changes? No, everything's about the same, okay. Two weeks later, I contact them and nothing. And four weeks later, I finally hear from the wife and it turned out that this innocuous investigation, which seemed like no big deal, um, seemed like a everyday Casper case, actually ended up with 
without going into detail because of their privacy, the, and again, this is what I believe. So I don't present things as fact. I believe in the demonic. Right. I believe in the dark side. Um, this was a case where the husband actually ended up, he was um, oppressed, being oppressed, we believe, by an entity that was there, very negative. And he actually ended up committing suicide in the house about three weeks after we were there. And this was a case that, you know, at that point, it seemed like that was pretty much it. We worked with the woman a little longer and then, you know, she cut ties. Well, fast forward years later, she had a new husband in the house and now they were being harassed by the dead husband. And wow, wow. it actually, yeah, it was terrible. And it actually ended up being a case that we took to Larry and Deb Elward. Um, if you guys are familiar with them, they work with John Zaffis on a lot of his negative cases. Yeah. Um, so we have Father La Larry and his wife, Deb, who's a clairvoyant. And we ended up actually having to take the husband and wife up to their house to have a, um, to have a, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> how did the word flop out of my head? Um, to have their home cleared right, by them right. and also for. <laughs> Anyway, I mean, we're not, we're not talking <laughs> exorcism, right? Yes. How did the mind come? It literally flew out of my head, um, which is interesting. But yeah, so we actually took them up there to have an exorcism. Now, this wasn't the dramatic, you know, like you see on TV with pea soup and right. things like that. Right. It was Father Larry quietly doing prayers over over the uh, the couple. But and then after we did that, and then they cleared them we had another team at the house and then Father Larry got on speakerphone and said prayers as they went around and they, they blessed parts of the house. So it was kind of a, a two pronged approach, but like I said, it started very, very quietly. It didn't seem like a big deal case, but it kind of goes to show that this stuff isn't something that you want to just walk into a house, think it's nothing and go challenging things or assume that it's no big deal and it's just entertainment. Cause this is a case where it ended as badly as a case could. Now the final result for the the couple that we ended up getting help with, uh, Larry and Deb, they ended up okay, um, and they were able to go on and, and just have a relatively normal life. But yeah, that was a case that it took a couple years to resolve and and to work with them and stay in touch and help them out. And yeah, I'm just really glad I was able to be a part of bringing the resolution to that family. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. sure. And uh, yeah. I think it shows that uh, I don't know what that feedback is for me. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty intense. Okay. Yeah, I think I know what it is. Um, well, it just goes to show that an assessment has to be done before you declare anything. Absolutely. All right. And well, even we're... talking about exorcism, you know, it's it's just prayers and clearing. You know, it's casting out. So it's not necessarily this dramatic thing. It's something that that happens, I think, quietly more than than people talk about, and honestly, for good reason. I think it is something that should be handled more quietly and not sensationalized, um, which is how I've always approached it. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to go clear out the negative entity in my house here. <laughs> and while I do that, I'm going to bring in our friend in Fort Worth, Texas, Mr. Michael Bo Jack Bullock. with Jack tonight? We're Jack tonight, yeah. Okay, Jack. It's a long story. I'll, t Jack I'll tell everybody Bullard. in the after show. Are you, going uh -oh. to, like, are you going to be Are you going to be Sting next week? Is that it? I, I, that's not a. Let me write that down. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be sting next week. Anyway, bring it on home, Mr. Bowler. You bet. Well, Rosalind, it is so nice. Once I heard your voice, I remembered you were on with us quite a bit back when yeah. George did Mondays. And Michael, nice to meet you. Congratulations, nice to meet you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, that was years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and and I just wanted to say to everybody, George had mentioned I make a little noise when I'm drinking. It's over 100 degrees. I'm a bit dehydrated, so. I wanted to suggest anybody playing along at home tonight, every time I take a drink, take a drink. So <laughs> not going to say what's in here. So, but thank you guys for, for, for spending your Friday night with us. Um, looking forward to this and we were short on time. So I'm going to jump right into some questions I had for you guys. Sure. Something that came up this week with some people that are going to be uh, coming into the paranormal that I've been talking to that have kind of been on the outskirts that are going to be joining me here soon was original thoughts. And I thought I, you know, Rosalind and, and Michael, this is going to be to you too, but I'm going to go to Rosalind first. And I thought you remembering the way you answered questions and the, the in-depth knowledge that you had on this field um, back in the day, 
this was a perfect opportunity for me to ask somebody that question, which was with all the learnings and everybody that tutors people once they get in and you've been in the field for a long time, can you remember back of what your first or some of your first original thoughts? And I'll share with you one of mine was, which kind of touches on what you said earlier was, as I said one night, way back in like 2008, 2009, to a group, I said, look, we don't know what we're hunting. It could be the spirit of a human being. And nobody wants to be hunted, whether you're dead or alive. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuck. That became my, my trademark with the Ghost Cowboys that I was a part of back then. So with that said, do you remember as you begin to get your feet wet and get into this field, what were some original thoughts that were not something that somebody had passed on to you, but as you begin to learn and begin to think about what you were doing, and said, hey, I've just come up with an idea myself. Um, one that I, it wasn't in the early days, but it was, you know, I, I started this in 1999 uh, was when I joined my first group. And back then it was mostly, you know, we as a group had things that we believed as a group. And when we would do lectures, we would go with our, with our beliefs. But so something that I developed years later is, um, People who visit different, you know, if you have maybe a haunted location that you're going to do multiple visits at and say on visit number two, you capture what seems to be a very clear EVP with some information. I always thought it was interesting. What if you not only took what information you get when you listen to that EVP later and think, OK, it said a name. Let me go back and see if I can connect with that person or it, it gave some crumb of information that you can expound on. I thought it would be interesting to go back and play. Yeah that EVP in that location and see if you can get a response or a reaction or a connection to that actual audio, assuming that they can hear it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't think I've seen people do that, but I always thought that would be interesting to try. Fascinating idea. So if you're dealing with an intelligent spirit, so to speak, what would happen if, say, that spirit heard themselves speaking, mm -hmm. which exactly. they probably haven't for years yeah, or had communication like that? And they would say, if, especially if they recognized you or even if somebody else brought it in, where did they get that? That's me speaking. Yeah. It, very interesting concept there. Any success with that? No, I haven't done it. <laughs> ah, you haven't done it. Yes. It's something I thought let's, would be interesting to try. As so, soon as everybody's okay to get out, go do that and let's, uh, let's get yeah. you back on. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to do that. Fascinating. Michael, how about you? Any, any, anything come to mind? Well, I was thinking about your question, and I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction. It wasn't necessarily an original thought, but my approach as I was um, entering into all this, uh, there was a, um, a group in my area. My brother was in it, and um, an another um, fascinating um, gentleman and good friend of mine, Christopher de Cesare. And I was a little bit younger and I didn't really know if I could perceive any of this stuff. And I was with a group of people who, you know, they could, they could see entities, they could hear things. They were, you know, coming up with, with theories and doing all, all sorts of really powerful research to kind of understand things. So my approach for many years was just to be there and just to help, you know, not necessarily be the person who's like, oh, well, I've got the answer now, like just to be there and just to help and to take it all in. And I think that um, um, coming from a place where slowly some of my gifts uh, and abilities started to grow, um, but they weren't there at the beginning, um, allowed me to just try and keep ego out of it and just try and to support others who were all doing the same work and um, have kind of a, 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 a group dynamic. So that's that was really formative to me, the, the approach of learning from others and supporting others even before like I could like necessarily have my first, Ooh, I just heard something or Ooh, yeah, I just saw yeah. something like it was, it was, I was going on faith in some ways that, that something could happen or was happening because many times I was like, well, okay, I got nothing. 
but to yeah. still be there and to still uh, try and be a positive part of the experience, um, it was very, it was very valuable to me, and I, I wouldn't really change that um, about my early days. I, I I love that man. I I think that's phenomenal, and I can see why. I don't know how long you guys have been together, but I can see why Rosalind was drawn to you. That's, that's phenomenal. We need more. We need more people <laughs> like you in this community, um, and and I can relate to that because one of the things that I found out that I had some people tell me early on was, is even though I felt like I was a small nobody and I don't have near the investigations under my belt, so many of you guys in the Northeast and like George do, but people, once they found out, they just wanted to come up and share their experience with me. And as soon as I told them, I've had other people tell me that they've had experiences like that. Mm. You could see this big emotional relief on their face of really, yeah. you know, I'm not alone. No, it happens to a lot of people, you know? So um, I think that's great. I, I really do. I think that uh, keep going in that direction. Definitely. That's, that's, that, that is more, we need more of that in the community. I want to jump to my second thought here tonight on that. And it is on the community. Um, in some of my discussions of light with us rebooting the channel, getting on YouTube and stuff like that here, I think the community, and I don't know, the community is very tight knit up North. Uh, in the Northeast. Ken seems to know anybody and everybody that's ever been involved up there. And thank God he's a part of us. Um, he uh, is able to communicate with so many different people. Down here, I've got friends in New Orleans and Texas, and some people are still in the field. Some people aren't. That my thought to you, Rosalind, and, and you, Michael, both is, is what do we need to do once we get past COVID to move forward with the community? Now, the Paracons and things like that that have been canceled, and I know Ken's the Ocean State which is one of the biggest and best ones out there. Uh, we'll get that going again. But I, I'd like to see a big influence of younger people. Uh, you know, you've got three old grumpy guys here doing a, a show. We got a guy down in Austin with the Paranormal Files who's doing a show who's one of the few. Now, he's got a lot of people listening. But I don't see that influence of what I see with them coming into the old regime. How do we begin to mold the two and bring the old and the young together as one community? Well, I think there's two possible approaches. Number one, when it comes to paranormal entertainment as a whole, um, I feel like the TV shows, which, you know, a lot of them have remained popular and, and have a good following, but I think something that is a challenge is that a lot of the shows still communicate with us, the viewer, as if we are armchair investigators, as if it's just right. people who are watching people investigate and they're not recognizing the fact that a large majority of the people have at very least, even if they're not part of an active group, they've gone to an event like Ken's and done the public ghost hunt that, that he allows them to do there and have had access to different haunted places and done, you know, one-off ghost hunts. So I think if they elevate um, their interaction with the audience, whether it's by, you know, having some sort of online um, component mm -hmm. of it, having an app that they add where people can interact with with the show or interact with a group while they're talking about or while they're watching the show. I think bringing technology into it in that way, in a social way could help. Um, now, as far as just young people in general, beyond entertainment, Michael and I have a good friend, his name is Justin Bamforth, and he runs a group called Normal Paranormal, um, where he basically just breaks down the paranormal for normal people. And one thing that Justin does that I think other people could do, again, using technology, now that we all know how to Zoom and, and things like that, Justin for many years has been hosting a very small, um, intimate, paranormal monthly meetup group um, where we just have mm -hmm. discussions about different topics. And when I lived down in Jersey and he lived right outside of Philly, I would attend in his home. Since I moved up here to New York, we attend virtually and we've been doing this for years. And, you know, having these little little groups of people where you can have these discussions where, like you say, it's not public, it's not about views, it's not about anything but the conversation and the, and the topic, I think that might start to bring some young people in as well. Because anytime I meet someone who I think, you know what, this is somebody who might benefit or have something to add to a discussion, you know, I, I'll invite them in. So, you know, I think that if we have some of these little things springing up that might encourage some younger people and some fresh voices and, and new ideas into the paranormal discussion. You know, I think you're on the I, I think the tech, 
Uh, uh, and there's my feedback. So I think our, our demon is floating around to everybody tonight. <laughs> We've had uh, uh, sound like a bomb going off. We had flagellants earlier. So who knows where all this is coming from. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. I um, wanted to interject one thing into that, if I could, Mike, is that I think we got to remember that young people coming to it in this day and age, we had different templates to follow when we were their age it could have been you know the internet was just you know starting to pop at that point there were books we read and things like that but a lot of young people are coming to this today from television as their template so in a way you almost can't blame them for the path that they're taking because this is what they see and of course this is you know we all have our origin stories right you know what motivated mm -hmm. us to get into it in this particular generation, a lot of them were turned on to this type of thing by what they saw on TV. So I think it's just natural in some ways to kind of want to imitate that. And I'm not saying that's the right way to go. In fact, I'll keep it real here. I think it's the wrong way to go. I mean, you can learn some things, of course, but you don't necessarily want that to be your guide. So... And the TV it. isn't the reality of it. I mean, as someone exactly. who's on paranormal television, you know, you know that there's time compression. You know, it looks like you're in an investigation for one evening and when you've actually been there for three nights and you've just worn the same clothes every day and things are spliced together um, or where reactions are taken out of context and spliced, Franken spliced um, into another spot. So, you know, it's not about faking things, but they still edit it to make it the most engaging. They want you to come back after that commercial break. So the scene yeah. needs to end with what was that, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, it's it's good that it, like Michael said, that it brought people's interest into the paranormal and made it more accepted. But, you know, it is still entertainment. And I think some people blur that line and don't see the difference between yeah, the paranormal and the paranormal. We got to remember to view it through that lens. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Michael, any... I, I think tech is the way to go. I think the tech ideas uh, with the younger people, which is what they're into, whether it's the paranormal or anything these days, uh, specifically with most of them staying home these days, I think remote yeah. viewing, which me and George did years ago mm -hmm. at a place uh, close to the Baker Hotel at the Haunted Hill House, which I'm gonna be returning to here soon, um, that the remote view, the remote investigating, which um, I think a lot of these kids could come up. I think the ideas that they could come up with on ways to investigate from a remote location could be phenomenal and it could change the game because it takes the human element out of it. Is it us that's causing the haunting? Well, if I'm not there at the location and I'm able to remotely use instrumentation and cameras and things like that and pick uh -huh. up evidence, it changes the game. Well, uh, it, it, I just had an idea. I mean, look at the popularity a few years ago of Pokemon Go where people were taking yeah. their cell phones and suddenly kids who've been, you know, like our our 16 year old over here who's locked in with his headphones and his YouTube, you know, who've been stuck inside and, and dealing with technology in the house, it got them out. What if you did a paranormal version of a Pokemon Go where it's got the GPS locator, you go to a location, you get evidence, you log it, somebody else can go, hey, let me go to that location and see if I get evidence. Like, you know, that could be a way to, to bring people together, so. All right, Paranormal Go. We heard it tonight first Do it. on the Paranormal <laughs> Channel here on Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected <laughs> with Rosalind Bound. Here it is. We heard it tonight first. Guys, run with it. I'm. I've got yeah. too much going on to, to develop that. But if <laughs> anybody wants the idea, go for it. <laughs> Let me write that down. Everybody, it's time to take a drink on that one. Uh, Michael, <laughs> anything you want to add on on the younger uh, generation? Well, yeah. I, obviously. Um, technology is, is a big tool, but, um, you know, I, I think back to what got me interested when I was a teen and it was relationships. And so, you know, I, I, I really can't, um, you know, uh, teach Ken DaCosta anything about, um, outreach and about, uh, having multiple styles of activities, but, um, you know, we may sometimes get locked into a mindset that it has to be uh, a haunted location from the hours of 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. You know, what about um, leading a ghost walk in a cemetery, you know, and or finding ways that um, 
make it feel very personal. And then maybe that also that offshoot of combine it with discussions. Um, the model that he has, that she mentioned, our friend Justin Bamforth, you know, let's meet up, have a little talk mm -hmm. about, you know, when I was in Rochester, maybe like uh, Frederick Douglass and then, you know, go for daytime stroll at the grounds where his house used to be. And then come back and again, without some people with technology, some people without technology, but all of us with our human gifts and abilities, what did you notice? What did you hear? You know, we were in a, a historic cemetery uh, last week, Rosalind, myself, and um, a friend of ours, Lisa Giordano here in the Hudson Valley. You know, it's 2 p.m. or 1 p.m. in the afternoon. They've got voice recorders running and we're just using our, our thoughts and our senses. And uh, our friend Lisa got a killer EVP just strolling through a cemetery on a, on a, you know, Monday afternoon or something. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, all, all ways that, uh, you know, if, if it, if it's meaningful to you, and this is, I was in education for a while and, and, you know, they say that the best teachers are passionate about their subjects. So, yeah. you know, Mike, exactly. George, Ken, if it's something that you gravitate mm -hmm. towards, you could probably, you know, just figure out ways to, take the big event and make it a smaller event or, or have it a, at a place where you, you haven't done it before and you'll find new people showing up and then just be your, your awesome selves and foster their interest. And you'll, you'll have people hooked. Absolutely. I think that's a phenomenal idea. Great idea. Um, George going to turn it over to you. I know we've got a lot of interesting chat questions after that last little bit there. Uh, questions and comments also, but um, I've got my own that I wanted to address uh, during this uh, time here before I turn it back over to Ken. But uh, Rosalind, 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 <laughs> haven't talked to you in forever, and and um, I was looking forward to this. And I'm going to tell you a very quick story, and um, and there's some advice that uh, I need you to give to. Funny enough, a uh, a young investigator. It's so amazing yeah. that, that Mike had pulled this up, uh, brought this up in the topics. But um, there is a, a young lady who lives up in St. Augustine, 30 minutes north of me. Of course, you know, St. Augustine's history is just phenomenal. Um, she was with the, uh, the, the tourism uh, bureau up there one night where I took her and her friend and we went around St. Augustine and we had actually a great spirit box session right by the cemetery blew her mind that she really got involved then after that in the paranormal. She's still with the tourism group. She's still with the St. Augustine old jail, but uh, she's really become fascinated with getting into this investigative ride. <laughs> now she is, I think 20, I want to say 28 or 27, still a young lady, African-American, much needed in this field to be able to really broaden the perspectives okay. and be able to see what kind of different reactions when you're going to a lot of these Southern locations you can get in that oh, scenario. Yeah. Her question to me, and we spoke at length um, on um, Facebook video, and then uh, we did a little co collective consciousness experiment, which brought the uh, anxiety down. And funny enough, her and her roommate said, you know what, I wasn't even scared when we did that. And I said, that's mm -hmm. the point. Her question to me, and I want you because Ashley is her name. Ashley is going to be watching this tomorrow. She's working actually at the old jail tonight. She's off tomorrow. I told her you were coming on. I actually tried to connect her with you on Facebook. I don't know if she's uh, sent a friend request yet, but I'll make sure she does. Her question, her first question out of her mouth is, how do I control the fear? So if you want to direct this towards Ashley as she's watching or anybody else, I would love for you to give her some encouragement how she can deal with that initial part. I think that we all start with, with our imagination in this field. I think the big thing that I've learned about fear is for me, when I'm fearful, I'm not usually afraid of what I'm encountering or what's happening. It's usually that dread and anticipation of what I think might happen next. So it's not that I feel the chill or heard the voice. It's that, okay, now what's it going to do to me? Is it going to hurt me? Is it, am I going to turn around and see something frightening? Right. So I think, you know, something my husband has worked really hard with me, um, just in general as a personality type is that struggle to remember to stay present because when you're worried about what's happening next, you're not in the present moment. 
Right. You're looking ahead and you can't generally accurately anticipate what's going to come. So I think taking some calming breaths, staying present okay. um, is, is a good way to start to deal with that fear of the anticipation. Um, the second thing is to just logically look at the evidence. I mean, in a, any encounter or any time that you've really been afraid, what has actually happened? You know, what was the result? Did something awful happen to you? Um, so that's another part of it. Um, a third thing that I would encourage is to remember that so much of this is in our mind, um, that it's not actually the reality of the situation. Um, also now she does, she deals with haunted locations. So sometimes she's dealing with actual ghosts. It's not, I heard the, the ice maker and I thought something was in my kitchen. Um, she's probably dealing with actual entities, but the other thing is to, to look at it on that human level, kind of make that, that human connection and realize that if, if this is a disembodied person, they might be just as afraid as you are. Um, so those are some things I, I would start with. Um, now, when it comes to feeling that maybe you're encountering something that, that makes you very uncomfortable, just in general, like every time I go in the sale in this jail, in this jail, I'm afraid. I feel like there's someone in there that, that wants to hurt me. Again, back to the human level. If you just walked into my house, I'm going to have some animosity towards you. So it's not that it's necessarily something wicked or scary or horrible. It could just be you're feeling that human emotion. So if she's a natural empath who's picking up on those emotions, she might walk into places and feel afraid. It could either be because she's feeling their fear and their emotions. And sometimes it's just the way your body processes energy. And until you learn that every time I encounter a spirit, I like for me, I would first notice that I was feeling a tightness in my chest and that would make me anxious. And then I finally realized, no, that's just my body's like weather vane. Like when I feel it, that's the result. I feel it here. So yeah kind of a combination of things, kind of looking at it as and from any of those different aspects might help her get a handle on, on a fear that's not really founded in anything specific. The, the, funny, the funny part is talking to Ashley, one of the things she keeps bringing up, she goes like, George, when I saw The Conjuring, and I'm like, it's no. a movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And again, as uh, Mike and, and Ken were both talking about this social media Mm -hmm. barrage that these kids are getting hit with and they get step into these fields and then all of a sudden as uh, shiona robertson was saying it's you know automatic response to get in if it's not you know they're not getting things jumping out of them the first 15 minutes boredom sets in now that's just yeah. not, this is not what i expected and it's, it's it's something that's really hard to get them out of so being somebody who's that age working in a tour industry and she's going to hear experiences she's going to hear stories and mm -hmm. then she's going to experience her own as well um i think it's going to help her really develop herself as an investigator and um you know i'll make sure to tell her to watch tomorrow for your advice to her i think it's excellent and uh we'll probably get together sometime here in the future when the weather cools and when we're not dealing so much with this pandemic and uh i'll yeah. do some working with her also but that leads me into this segue before i turn it over to ken uh i wanted to ask you both this uh, whole aspect about social media, this whole aspect about the television shows, you know, uh, now, you know, as e even though I'm just here taking care of my dad, I, Mike's got a significant other, Ken's got a significant other, not involved in the paranormal. Both of you are entrenched in this field. So when you're sitting at home watching a paranormal show, who is the one that has to be calmed down before they punch this TV screen? <laughs> We actually don't watch much TV when it comes to paranormal. Smart. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't remember the last. You know, if we do watch a show, it's it's that might have been. Yeah, if we do watch a show, it's to support a friend. You know, because right. there's a lot of people we care about that are doing shows or having appearances. So you know, we might watch it for that. But yeah, I, I mean, you know, we under like we like like uh, Ken was saying, we understand why people behave the way they do on, on TV. We just, we don't think it's, it's probably for the best. <laughs> so, you know, we don't, we just tend not to turn it on. Probably I didn't even right. watch my own show. No offense to anyone else. I didn't even watch my own show. Sage advice. <laughs> okay, Mr. DaCosta, turn it over to you, sir. Yeah, I'm back here with the artist formerly known as Mike Bowler. Um, <laughs> Um, hey, I, before we get into um, 
our our seven questions here. There's something I wanted to ask, Michael. Can, can you tell us a little bit about angel card readings mm -hmm. and how that differs from, or does it differ from, the typical tarot card readings? So, in essence, um, it's kind of like uh, using the internet but using, um, rather than Google, using like Safari, it's like a different web browser and it, it, it runs on a different pathway. Mm -hmm. um, so um, when I, I was first just sat in on a circle um, that Roz was doing um, involving angel cards about four, four or five years ago in, mm -hmm. in New Jersey and it, it felt very um, harmonious with my um, with my outlook, and thus, uh, you know, I pursued it uh, obviously with her. So, you know, my answer is that um, we all have some buddy, something watching out for us, be it angels, uh, spirit guides, um, loved ones on the other side, sure. um, and in an angel card reading that usually allows the cards to, to tell a story, uh, uh, to tell, give some kind of assurance, answer a question, give perspective on a crisis. And, um, classically many tarot sessions would perhaps be like past, present, future. Um, they may deal with major life circumstance, those types of things. Um, the angel cards, they often ha um, happen to be like an affirmation, a nudge, something we've already been thinking about or someone just was talking with us about. And it's like a, hey, yes, keep doing that. Or mm -hmm. that thing that you stopped doing, do more of that. Mm -hmm. So the style just tends to be like really warm and therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And gentle. Gentle. Loving. Loving, not, not scary, not doom and gloom. And it's been a, uh, an amazing experience. Um, and in the miraculous way that these things work, you know, sometimes uh, on a weekend event, we'll have four, five, eight people with very similar um, issues going on. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, wow, how did that happen? Like, mm -hmm. like you know, a lot of people dealing with a, um, with a terminal illness or at another event, like, four or five people who've had suicides happen in, in their life and in, the, in their circle. And, um, and then we're doing a reading and the cards are reflecting back at us. So it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I just, I just pray every time. And mm -hmm. I reach out to, to those who, you know, choose to be in my corner and help guide me and, you know, just, just be there for someone. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, uh, it's, it's a great experience. Yeah. And we do them remotely. So if anyone, is curious and um, you know has a need or that kind of thing, you know find our information on Facebook and you know give Ken DeCosta and George and Mike their cut and uh, then <laughs> then we'll talk. We'll, we'll set something up for you. One of the other things before um, one last question here. Um, both of you have a love of music, yes. And all of us that have been doing this for a while. We don't typically go home and just talk about the paranormal all the time. There are things we use to decompress, get away from all this. Uh, how does music play into your stepping outside of this for a little while and just kind of, you know, putting your putting your mind and your head in a different place? Music is huge for us. Um, when you are dealing with, whether it's the paranormal, the spiritual aspects of things, you know, it's inevitable that you're dealing with some very heavy emotions and, and difficult circumstances. And, um, you know, a specific example, and now Michael has been, you know, a musician, a songwriter for many years. I can't sing. <laughs> I know like three chords that I keep forgetting on the guitar, but I have recently um, delved into songwriting as well. and. You know, Michael and I have a friend who is going through a terminal illness and is has been told that, you know, she only has a couple weeks. Um, and, you know, this is someone that, that we've we actually read at an event. She's a, a, a wife of a friend of mine from from my old ghost group. 
she came to an event last year. We gave her an angel card reading and read the whole family. And, um, and then we just got this news recently in the last couple of weeks. And, you know, you go through the whole process of the mourning and the, and the fear and the sadness and, and all of that. But one way that Michael and I have been working on dealing with those emotions is we're co-writing a song um, about her that isn't, that it's, she's the impetus for it, but it can apply to any family who, or, or mother who is, you know, looking at having to leave their husband and their, their child or children behind. So, you know, it, healing has so many healing, or music has so many healing aspects to it. And um, we definitely are, are taking advantage and, and using it to not only help ourselves and help her, but maybe help other people that are dealing with these difficult life and death things. Because when it comes down to it, this whole ghost thing, and the reason that we do take it so seriously is, you know, thrill seekers are out thrill seeking, but we realize that paranormal investigation is about that fear and that question that we all have, which is right. what happens after we die and are my loved ones still with me? So that's why we keep it positive and we keep it focused on, on that aspect. Yeah. Very well said, very well said. Um, before, Ken, you take it to the next uh, step uh, for our guests. Uh, now that's you brought that up, uh, we're going to have Michael and Rosalind are going to compose a song for Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected. And that'll... <laughs> Be yes. our opening, our opening song every single week before. Let we the end. royalties commence. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Woo. <laughs> With that, Ken, we turn it over to you. All right. So I must ask our lucky contestants tonight: Do you have pencil, pens, and papers ready here? Yes. Okay, we're going with this, but we're going to do something a little bit different tonight with the husband-wife team of Rosalind and Michael, and it all begins right now. <laughs> now I'm just working. I'm just working out some stuff in my head here. Okay, so we have seven deadly questions for Rosalind and Michael Lewis. Are you ready, folks? Yes. Okay. Question number one: What city or area that you visited seems like it would be a nice place to live? Hmm. Nice place. Oh. I take these things very seriously. Uh, As you should. Hmm. It could be a state. It doesn't have to be just a city. Uh, an area, a state, place, a city, a town. Hmm. Okay. Got it. State of mind. <laughs> All right. Hold up your answers, please. You got to get them up higher. Rosalind says Rochester. You got it. Gotta go higher. And Michael, how about you? Toronto. 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 Mike just wants out of here. <laughs> beautiful. Hey, beautiful city. Beautiful city. All right, very good. Question number two. Do you think if you had met at 16 years old, you would have gotten along? Hmm. Wow, it's taking a long time. <laughs> He's writing a lot. I'll Ooh. answer. <laughs> I yes. think yes. Point. Yes. Though I probably would have totally friend zoned him. <laughs> I said yes, but I probably would have been too scared to talk to her. Well, okay. I didn't like nice guys back then. Yeah. I was an idiot. <laughs> I, I ran away from girls. <laughs> Michael, thankfully you got over your shyness. So. You did very well for yourself. She grabbed me and helped. Okay. Uh, okay, third question. I want you to rank these breakfast foods in order. Pancakes, waffles, French toast. Oh. We are very frequent um, breakfast for dinner people. Brinner? Yeah, I, I do. Yes, we love it. All right. Hopefully he gets this right. Oh, Shana so close. Uh-oh. Shauna Robinson looks like she's waiting uh, in Toronto for you. All right, Robinson, nice. French toast, 
pancakes, waffles. French uh, toast, waffles, pancakes. Grounds okay. for divorce, man. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I guess I would, it would be waffles, pancakes, French toast. You've Ooh. never had my French toast. Oh, man. She lays on the cinnamon. She, uh, it's good. What's that? Wow. The Meg, edging, vanilla. The it's edging delicious. Gets, mm. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll be there. Uh, there you go. Question four Who's more likely to forget about or be late for something? <laughs> Michael. Michael yes. and me. Okay. <laughs> so it's unanimous. Unanimous. The shy ones. Second. The shy ones are always the ones that are late, aren't they? <laughs> All right. Next question. Which one of you is more likely to come back as a ghost from the afterlife? Oh boy. I think we both have a problem. I say definitely me. I said okay. me. I have major attachment issues. Oh, that's well, true. <laughs> that's a good well, point. at least none of you seem to have a commitment issue because you're going to get right back into it. That's awesome. All right. Question uh, six. Who is more likely to have too much to drink and attempt a headstand? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, Good. disagreement again. Michael, what? Wow. Okay. When, when she's buzzed, she has no clue <laughs> what she's actually doing. She, when That's it hits, true. you know, there was, she could be walking and touching both sides of a hallway and be like, I'm walking straight. One time in Rhode Island that happened. One time. Made an impression. <laughs> and Ken's from Rhode Island, so bonus points to me. Well, we're a very small state up here, so it's going to make the rounds when you do that. Right? <laughs> They all, they all know. They know yeah. about you. Oh, I, I mean, I've done it once in Rhode Island, too. <laughs> and our final question. If you were attending a seance, what historical figure would you most like to summon? Ooh. Oh. Oh, I know. Oh, Since nice. I'm from outside of Philly, I'm a big fan of Ben Franklin. Ben. Yes. Abraham oh, I Lincoln. Okay. I was I, mean, I was watching a uh, I was watching a Peter Jennings special when he was walking through the White House. I think with Bill Clinton shortly after he was elected, and they were standing in the Lincoln bedroom, mm. and they're talking about the fact that it's purportedly haunted. And I saw this like six foot two glowing shape like standing next to him. I'm like. He's, he's, he's right there. He's right there. So, wow. You know, I've never heard that story. Oddly wow. enough, Abraham Lincoln, when I've asked variations of this question before, his name has come up. So I can imagine that Abe's in the afterlife and said, mm -hmm. Abe, it's for you again. Oh, that's right. <laughs> what do they want now? Right. But, I gave them the Gettysburg Address. It's all right there, people. Ah, jeez. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for playing. We're going to bring Pleasure. everybody back in right now to say uh, <laughs> goodbye. An hour goes by far too fast, but um, it's amazing to talk to you folks again. I guarantee we're going to do this again soon, as soon as Anytime. You know, the, the Paul lifts over the country and everybody can give each other hugs again. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Awesome sauce. Thank you so much, everyone, for having us. Thank That's you, everyone great. in the chat room, and uh, yeah. and all that. Reach out to us if uh, if you want to say hi. Yeah, we're here. How can people contact you? Um, easiest way is on Facebook. We have a page called Song of the Spirit, um, and that's where we we post a lot of our things. And yeah, it's probably the easiest way. We're also on Instagram under our names. True. All right, uh, Michael. We're coming up on the weekend, so work on that song for us, Rosalind. Both you guys, <laughs> you got it. Thank you so much. You got it. Thank you, guys. Talk to All you right. soon. It's been a pleasure. Be well. Good night. Pleasure bye. Talk. Bye, bye. All right, guys. We are going to. Uh,
go to our break. Uh, on the other side of our break, we have a, an amazing Matt Resvali, actor producer, is going to be joining us for the second hour. Uh, but this is the time for you guys to take a break, uh, replenish your coffee, your beverage, and come back with us on the other side. We'll see you then. You are watching Dead or Paranormal Resurrected right here on the Paranormal Channel, also on our Facebook page, Dead or Paranormal Resurrected. Again, guys, uh, anything in the comments for our questions for our guests, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'll see you just on the other side. You're watching Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected on the Paranormal Chat. Oh, shit. Hey, everybody, this is Nick Roth. Paranormal Lockdown, Ghost Adventures, Nick Ruff Investigates, new series coming out, Viddy Space, G Crew, and you're watching Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected on the Paranormal Channel. Am I a ghost or are we all ghosts in this reality? Think about it. Oh, hey guys. George Lopez here, host of Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected on the Paranormal Channel. You know, in today's trying times, many if not all of us are adversely affected by what is going on in the world. I'm here to tell you that the paranormal field is no exception. By nature, the paranormal investigator pushes through the inherent dangers of the field. Spirit. Can you tell me your name? But now, this brave foot soldier of the ghostly realms must also consider the need for spiritual social distancing. Scientists have yet to discover if the beyond is safe from infection. Are you here? Give us a sign. Oh, stay six feet, six feet away. And by proximity, able to transmit it to the living. Yeah, it looks haunted. So let's be careful out there, my para warriors. Practice spirit distancing at all times. You know, they say laughter is a good medicine. I happen to agree. I happen to agree with that. So, if you're looking for a fun distraction from all the things going on in the world right now, good conversation, great guests, join myself. Mike Bowler and Ken DaCosta every Friday at 9 p.m. on the Paranormal Channel, Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected. Be safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much. I'm Kissy Duncan of Oddity Files, and you're watching Dead Air Paranormal Resurrected on the Paranormal Channel. If you guys could just get out of here, I've got some things to do. No, 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 no. All right, the woman who says, I have something to say, you came across strong. Can you come across first to say St. Augustine and we'll get your question in. St. Augustine. St. Augustine. Oh! <laughs> you 
are great. You are great. Okay. Film Festival in Horror History. I am honored to be presenting the official selections. And the winner is... You! Unpleasant dreams. When you're talking about having Elvira be a host and be part of a big event such as this. We are <laughs> we're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to our guest joining us for our second hour. He's an actor, producer. Uh, he's producer of Shockfest Film Festival, which uh, we are going to talk about with our amazing guest at this time. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Matt Rosvalli. Matt, thank you for joining us tonight, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to Elvira, see you. Elvira, Elvira, wow. Yeah, we were really excited about that. Um, we're all big fans of her, and man, the moment we heard the word that she was in, we were we were all happy. That's all I can say about it. Yeah. Well, let, let me introduce you. Of course, you know Mr. Ken DaCosta, also Jack Bowler tonight, Mike Bowler, out of the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. So you got one guy who says, Pock the car, and the other one says, Saddle of Horses. I, we're the only ones that speak English, you and I. <laughs> right, right. I'm from New York. Hey, nice to meet you, Jack. And Ken, it's good to see you again, man. It's good to see you, Matt. Thanks for coming on tonight, brother. Thanks uh, for having me. You and I saw me. that's awesome. You put the bumper up there. I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we uh, talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago. You just call and just kind of check in, see what was going on. And I couldn't wait to have you on. Talk a little bit about Shock Fest and a little bit about yourself and we'll get to know you a little bit. Um, tell us a little bit before we start getting into the meat and potatoes of this tell us a little bit about shock fest and how that all comes together because it's not just a one-day event for you that's right um well i'll gosh you know shock fest has, has always been a film festival uh in hollywood but and it's been going on for about 12 years but honestly shock fest is the energy behind it has been more like a dark carnival, a, a traveling show that um, immerses you in the experience as if you're inside of a movie. Um, even when I started working there as a host in 2013, and it, at the time it was hosted at Raleigh Studios in Hollywood, it, 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 they, they always had a haunted attraction, they had really cool celebrity guests, and over the past couple of years, it's grown into something so much bigger. Last year, we were at a, a venue in Holly, in uh, Las Vegas called Hotel Paranormal, where every floor of a haunted hotel, and it is an actual haunted hotel in Las Vegas, we converted into an escape room experience. And that's the kind of stuff we like to do. We like to create immersive environments. We're really big fans of the paranormal, and we actually have a travel series called Haunted Routes, which... We traveled across the East Coast, uh, the West Coast, and Route 66, it, meeting paranormal investigators all over the country and uh, visiting haunted locations. And we also like supporting independent artists and filmmakers. And, you know, around the time COVID hit, we originally had a plan that we're going to go on tour. We're going to hit New York City, uh, Las Vegas again, and Hollywood. Those are our three best spots. And, of course, COVID adjusted our plans in frankly a better way because we made friends with the owner of Silvercast Media who is a company that runs the largest most high-tech billboard in the United States and it's in Times Square and it's outside the Marriott Hotel in Times Square it's one of those iconic spaces I'd be happy to show you a picture if I could share a screen I'm not sure if that's even possible but uh mm -hmm. oh there's a share screen button but yeah no um we're gonna be broadcasting a segment of our show off of this billboard. May I share this picture? I have it synced up right here. Yeah. Cool. Check this out. Share screen. All right. I don't know. Can you see the screen or what are you looking at? I'm seeing it now, I think. There we go. There we go. Wow. That's where we're going to be hosting Shockfest, right there. 
It's an online experience. So Elvira is going to be uh, announcing the award, uh, the award winner of the Women of Horror Award, on on Zoom in a virtual environment. But we're actually going to be broadcasting a segment of our show on this billboard, and it'll be the finale of the show. That's fine. And uh, we're posting the posters of the uh, filmmakers in our uh, poster competition. The finalists will be posted on this billboard, along with a bunch of our friends and celebrity guests and. It'll be an interactive experience for everybody. So that's that's what we're about. That and Ghost. That's phenomenal. And I love the idea that you are giving filmmakers an opportunity to get their art and to get their work out there. I would imagine a lot of these people, you know, you start making films when you're in grade school, you know, whether it's Lego films or stop motion or whatever the case may be. And then uh, a lot of kids coming out of college that have... We got to hold on because when he linked that, I could not remove it. And then it removed him. So he's going to have to pop back in here in just a second. Okay. Um, because that was um, that was not the plan. And that's the first time ever that any one of our guests actually saw the screen share and pulled that over there. So that was that was unique. Sorry about okay, that, Matt. Matt's back. I tried Thank to close out the. Uh, I tried to close out the share screen. Oh, share I was screen. wondering what that was. Yeah, no, sorry about that. That was my bad. Um, yeah, no. Um, sorry, what were uh, what were we talking about before? Uh, I was rudely interrupted. <laughs> Thank you, <George. laughs> What did, what did I miss? Ken. Yeah, well, what I was saying is, I think it's fantastic that you're giving filmmakers an opportunity to bring their art to the public. Uh, in this kind of opportunity, I would imagine there are a lot of young people, maybe fresh out of college or maybe not even, but have an interest in it that know a little bit about special effects and makeup and things like that, who have written screenplays and they have a chance to get their work into the public eye. I think it's phenomenal that you're giving these, these people an opportunity to do that. We really work hard to provide opportunity for artists because, gosh, the arts industry is such an intangible thing to pursue. It's not like any other industry where there's a job and a ladder that you can climb and a hierarchy to attain. You have to make up your own income out of a product that doesn't have the value that medicine does or, um, you know, a, a real estate. So you gotta be first of all, really good. And you also have to be able to avoid the many traps that Hollywood puts you into when you move to that part of the country. Right. And we want to make sure that we're very artist friendly and we give people value. We want to give people something that really showcases what makes them so special. And that's why we are still kicking, even though COVID really mm -hmm. knocked a lot of things, pe things and people down. Um, a lot of shows are closing up. And we decided this is the time we're going to double down and we're going to work harder to make sure people who are really going out of their way to invest in us, like their time and their movies, we're going to give them some incredible opportunity. We give away free tickets. We give away free alcohol. We give them opportunities to shine on this billboard. And we are still going on tour. We're still moving and we're doing it in a safe manner that makes sure that no one's like exposing themselves to the elements. And that's, you know, really it in a nutshell. We want to make sure everybody's having a good time and, you know, getting their work out there. Yeah. I just, I think it's a fantastic platform for these people to get their work seen. But I wanted to ask about Mac Rose Valley a little bit. And here's my question. Matt, you've been to my home. And matter of fact, we're in the room right now. Awesome. Where we sat and you filmed and we had a nice chat and uh, subsequent other chats after that. You seem like a very kind, sweet man, gentleman, an intelligent man, a soft-spoken man. What brought you to the world of horror and what was your evolution like in terms of what got you into this genre? I've always been into it. Um, I can't, it's tough to answer that question because I can't, I don't know. Um, I can probably start with, I was born with the umbilical cord around my neck. I could probably start with everything scared me, including Santa Claus and the mall. 
Um, I could probably start with, I love the symmetry of sharp angles of shapes like triangles, except long ones. And that's a very scary, you know, sharp objects are scary and bizarre things fascinate me. It's also why I'm into the paranormal. It's why we got into haunted routes, the travel series we do, because we wanted to answer the question, are ghosts real? I want to face the things that freak me out. And these days it's not the supernatural and it's not the horrific things you see in media because that stuff's fun. The stuff that freaks me out these days. Now I'm that frankly, those are my real struggles in life. And those are the things that I'm facing every day. And that's a step up from what I did as a kid facing horror movies. And I guess it's just, I think that's probably it. I, I like facing fears. I like jumping into chaos and I like, um, experiencing life on a really high, uh, to a high capacity. Yeah. Well, now that brings us to um, Haunted Rose before I turn this over to Jack. This was a um, documentary that you did where you traveled on one hand, West Coast, East Coast. Am I correct? Um, yeah, we did a series. We did three documentaries. One of them was a, a, dry, a road trip from Lebec, Maine, which is the most northeastern point of the United States, down to the Florida Keys. And we visited uh, just about every major haunted spot. We showcased a bunch of them, but we visited like all of them um, in the various states, all the way up and down the East Coast. And we did the same thing from Anchorage, Alaska on the West Coast down to San Diego. And our first one was a road trip across Route 66 from Chicago, Illinois to Santa Monica, California. And we visited lots of crazy things. We uh, like the Lemp Mansion in uh, St. Louis. Um, a couple of ghost towns like uh, Texola, Oklahoma, and uh, we saw the Biltmore Hotel on the East Coast. Of course, we visited Sleepy Hollow, Robert the Doll. Um, gosh, uh, Salem. Salem was a really big spot. We stayed at the uh, Hawthorne Hotel in the Haunted Room where uh, supposedly the most activity. We, we've done that consistently throughout the entire country. We were even in um, uh, Deadwood at the Bullock Hotel, which had the most haunted room and we met a lot of people along the way, a lot of people who studied the paranormal, ghost hunters, paranormal investigators, reviewed their evidence, got to know their personalities, made a lot of really good friends. And then along the way, we started meeting with physicists and scientists and people who are on that side of the spectrum and skeptics and learned a lot about the question that I always had watching the Discovery Channel, are ghosts real? Right. You know, because no documentary on the Discovery Channel growing up ever really answered that question in a satisfying <laughs> manner to me. Um, I was always freaked out about what was in the dark. And I know that's pretty consistent with everybody. I'm sure a lot of your viewers feel that way. And I spent a lot of time trying to solve that by visiting these haunted hotels and meeting these people. And I've come to my own conclusions on the subject since then, which I'm happy to talk about, but it's sure. probably a little more controversial on this uh, podcast than most people would feel. No, no, <laughs> we're an open book here. Yeah. So feel free to share. Um, one of the things I really like about it is it almost serves as a travel guide on another yeah. level because, you know, you bring these places to people and they might say, hey, you know, that's interesting let's hop a plane or let's take a vacation and, you know, maybe visit these places, stay at these places. So I think it serves on that level in that regard as well. That was one of the many levels we wanted to hit with this. We wanted to map out this awesome road trip. Guys, if you want to go on a cost country road trip and you're into ghost stuff, watch these documentaries because they hit all the cool places. If you're going across the iconic route 66, which is a ghost in and of itself, because it technically doesn't exist anymore. By the way, take the side roads. It's better than the highway. The highway sucks. <laughs> right. Um, Break that down. These are the places to visit. Um, oh, my gosh. I could probably talk about some of my favorite places. Uh, it, interestingly enough, the best part was meeting the people, though. Like, since, you know, we met uh, a really good friend of mine now who was actually a guest at our last Shock Fest event with John Zathis. And, he has a lot of really cool stuff to talk about and encounters that he's had. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll say this about even my views on the paranormal, and I see there's some questions here I'm happy to answer. I'll, I'll start off with this just 
to see if it kicks any other questions from you guys. The more I've been exposed to paranormal and paranormal activity, the more skeptical I've gotten to the point where I question if any of it is real. And I say that because I've noticed nature works in very strange ways that we don't necessarily understand that are surprising. And human nature is very fallible. Our perspectives are very fallible. And the things that we remember is not necessarily what actually happened because we have the ability to fabricate memories. Um, and I don't mean to take away any experience anyone has ever had, nor do I mean to say that ghosts aren't real. I only mean to say that nature works like a thief in the sense that when you think you understand how nature functions, it'll surprise you in a brand new way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we see something like something moving or like a table lifting or, or a, 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 a specter appearing, anything, and those are extreme examples, I feel like it could be anything, including a paranormal situation. Right. And I and to be honest, my goal is to side with the paranormal investigators trying to prove ghosts are real, because I want to prove they're real. But I feel like the only way to prove they're real is to start off with that attitude that just because you can't debunk it doesn't mean it's paranormal. Right. But it doesn't mean it's not either. So that's yeah, my I, attitude. On it. That's well, yeah, well because said. I mean, regardless, that is very well said, Matt. And you know. I think sometimes we get tied up in the minutia of this where everything is paranormal because we want it to be. And rather than focus on the actual small amount of things that we have a difficult time explaining, because <clears throat> when you go in with that type of bias, whether you're a believer or whether you're a skeptic, you're already approaching it from a certain mindset. So yeah. I think that, I think that's well said and you're not far from, you know, Speaking for myself, and I think my co-hosts, what what they actually believe too. I, I take um, I take that attitude from an NYU physicist professor who was super enlightening. I, I reviewed a lot of evidence with him uh, from all over the country, from um, <clears throat> Napa to um, Salem, Oregon, to uh, Texas, Amarillo, um, everywhere. I just showed him ghost hunt footage and. His response was consistently, this is fascinating examples of nature working in unpredictable ways. Right. Um, and he emphasized the scientific method is to uh, be in total control of the environment that you are doing these experiments in, when in fact, as much as a good paranormal investigator's job and I use air quotes and job because it's not a monetized position. I, if, I, from what I understand, I am not, I, I'm not a paranormal investigator, but the ones I've met are take a very firm stance that they're not here to take money from people. Right. Um, you need to be in total control of your environment in order to catch that evidence because you never know when a light turning on could be faulty wiring mm -hmm. or a breeze if something knocks or, uh, you know, a cell phone going off if an EVP or, 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 or um, I'm sorry, K2 meter goes off. And that's a really tough thing when you're working in a house because you really don't have total control unless you're in like a sterile lab environment. Right. But with that right. said, it's and still amazing to do the process of investigating. You know, it's fun and yeah, I, I totally I understand it. The process, the process itself is the thing I think that fascinates me personally more than anything else. It's, um, you know, because when people say, well, how do you define a successful investigation? You might think it's when we get evidence. To me, it's always been if we follow a systematic process and we remain objective and whatever the conclusion is to me that's success um wanted to remind everybody you are watching dead air paranormal on the paranormal channel our guest this evening for the second hour matt rose volley and uh let me see we have a question for you matt from michelle welker at matt rose volley what was the most memorable visit to a haunted place you have had i'm gonna tell you the one story that makes me question my very firm stance that I just shared with you. When I was in Mississippi, um, 
we were visiting the Bouv, uh, the Beauvoir, um, Jefferson Davis's home, and we stayed in a in a complex, which was a series of houses right on on a lake right near the Gulf Coast. I don't remember what it was, but it, it like it, it, the people running this complex, and it was like we had like a, jo- a large two bedroom hut. It was awesome. The people running this complex understood, learned who we were. We were doing a travel series. In fact, we were filming our Gulf Coast sh- version of the show, which we actually are converting into our upcoming film, Paranormal Investigators of America. I can talk about that later. Um, and they said, you know, there was a murder in one of our hou- housing units about two weeks ago. And it's still locked up and it hasn't been cleaned up. There's no blood or anything, but we would be willing to give you the key. So we said, yes, let's, t- let's do it. You know, for no other reason than that sounds fascinating. I'd love to see what an environment like that is. What's the energy like there? What, you know, I've never been that close to something that violent. Well, maybe I have, but I, I, I did a documentary <laughs> at Standing Rock during that fiasco. Um, when we got into the housing unit, the air was literally thick. And you ever been in a room with somebody that is violent as hell and you feel like any second they're going to attack you and you feel something's going to happen? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that. And I saw Bibles placed at the staircase in the bedroom upstairs. And there was like holes in the wall where clearly there was violence and uh, punches and attacks on individuals. And the Bibles were placed in the positions where the bodies had fallen. We took an EVP session, and I didn't get anything from it. I still have the recordings. Maybe somebody who's better at studying this stuff can hear them and actually pick something out. I didn't hear anything. But I'll tell you this. Being in that environment, I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. I felt something. And I know consciously you can't trust your feelings. I know consciously I need tangible evidence, but I... The sensation of being in that space was enough to make me question my own judgment. Mm -hmm. It was intimidating to be there. And it felt like there was something there. And I don't know what that was. I don't want to call it a ghost because I didn't see anything. And I I, I hate saying something's haunted as much as I want things to be haunted. But that's the closest thing to a real paranormal experience I've had. That was very memorable. Besides that, it was the Lemp Mansion in, in St. Louis. Go there because the freaking buffet is amazing. They they serve you yeah. amazing. Oh so good. Oh my god! I was uh, a couple of years back well, Thanksgiving uh, couple, over there. Yeah, a couple of days away from jumping on a plane because one of the people in my group travels for her job, and she actually had to go to St. Louis. And stayed there, and she said they were absolutely wonderful and welcoming. So at some point, the only thing they said about Lent Mansion, don't wander too far away from the mansion. It's not like the greatest neighborhood in the world. It's not the greatest neighborhood. Um, that, that, those are real-life problems, guys. That's not ghosts. That's like, you know, yeah. in the ghetto. But like, it's where you make ghosts. Amen, <laughs> amen to that. It's hey, a when, haunted- uh, it's got an amazing history. There's like tunnels underneath it. It's yeah, awesome, awesome building. And I, I, it's the only time I've been to St. Louis. I don't really visit that part of the country too often. I'm such an East Coaster, but I loved it. It was amazing. Yeah. All right. With that, Matt, I am going to introduce you to Jack Bowler from the great state of Texas. Jack, take it away. The home of Robert Rodriguez. Hey, hey. Hey, man. I can't tell you how excited I was when Ken said he had a connection with you and you were coming on. I've been doing this for uh, going on 10 years with George. I am a huge skeptic. So your skepticism is is welcomed here. Uh, we have had debates. I have said I love the paranormal. There's nothing more I would love to see than to get out there one night and see something for myself. I've seen enough to keep me going, but I'm always looking for more. Uh, but your film work is what interests me because I think this all ties into the paranormal. Um, I was fortunate enough years ago, back in 2005, 2006, to be associated with some people that I still am that are in the film business here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I can remember a guy 
saying to me is he was trying to film a sitcom that he had gotten a bunch of actors that he found of local talent to get a, a sizzle reel going uh, for some people to, to do something. And even though it looked great and everything turned out and other than the catering being way too high for his budget, and he complained openly about that, um, at the end of the day, he had a great product, but it didn't go anywhere. And a couple of years later, he says to me, he goes, you know where I failed? I hired dramatic or I found dramatic actors. I needed comedy actors that everybody specializes. So I thought tonight, I, I know a lot of younger people here in Texas that are looking and love the horror industry and the films. And I want to get into some of the films that you like and what got you going in this in a minute. But what's the difference between somebody who's getting into this that would make a good horror actor? To, you know, what, what are the differences? Do you have comedy? Do you have drama? Most people can't play them all. There are a few that can cross over. What's it take if you have young people looking to get into this uh, type of movie? Uh, what's it take for a, a young person to do and get into the shock type films that you love? Interesting. Are you talking, you're talking horror, I assume, right? Like how do you, what, what does it take to get in the well, horror? Well, okay, let's, let's, let's back up a minute. And maybe I'm ahead of myself here, which I've known to do. Explain to everybody what's the difference. What is shock fist about? What, is the qualifications of a movie to get into that type of genre? You know, we look at passion behind the filmmaking. When it comes to submissions of Shockfest, I mean, we take a lot of varieties. We do screen really top-notch stuff. Like, the Soska sisters made a film last year called Rabbit, which was a remake of a David Cronenberg classic. We also screened Perry Tao's The Ascent. We screened Clive Barker's Candyman, the original one. Clive was actually in attendance with us last year. It was awesome. Big fan of that guy. Um, we screened Eli Roth's Cabin Fever. You know, we, we do those big movies, but we also do smaller ones because we love young artists and we love struggling artists and we love artists, struggling or not. Right. right. So the thing we really look at is are you passionate about what you're doing? You know, cause I feel like most people don't give passionate people enough credit. Um, it's kind of, that's what I look for. I, I look for somebody who really cares about what they're making. That that's, if you're entertaining to me and I, I, I get entertained by seeing that people are having a great fucking time behind the camera. Pardon my French, um, behind the camera. Yeah. That's what it's I like. Yeah, I, 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 and you probably haven't heard of the guy. I'm going to throw a name out there. Michael Ledesma, who's down in Austin, Texas. That's from cool. Fort Worth. His mom lives with my uh, fa sister. Uh, they're good friends, uh, yeah. live together, and that is her son. Uh, he is a filmmaker down in Austin, Texas. And Austin right now is a hotbed. I mean, Austin, I'm down there as much as I can be. Uh, Austin is probably the coolest place in Texas, as most people who've been to Texas know. I hear that. I, I still yeah. haven't been to Austin. It's one of the few places oh, I've man. been to. Yeah, yeah, you got to go. Austin is there. Um, so some of the movies that, you know, he talks about that I've watched a few there, could you suggest kind of a starter package for people to get into these shock horror type films that haven't seen many of them? Oh, like what? What are the horror movies that I recommend for people to watch? Yes, mm -hmm. gosh. Objectively, and this isn't subjective. I'm going to make a very bold statement and say objectively, <laughs> one of the best horror films ever made is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Ooh. and it's relevant to what we're talking about. Is in Texas. Objectively, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I would dare say, is one of the best horror films ever made. There's the classics out there. Jaws is amazing because it's just such it, it transcends genre. There's a uh, Exorcist. Those are like given answers. I can talk subjectively. I can tell you some of my favorites, but I think if you really want to get started, you start with Texas Chainsaw. Um, gosh, new stuff. New stuff's rough. Uh, there's a lot of good new stuff out there, but I think the classics are really where you want to start. Evil Dead has a really good um, sense of humor about itself. Mm -hmm. um, Alien, the Ridley Scott movie, Alien, because it's such a, goth, a gothic um, horror film, even though it's sci-fi, it's labeled sci-fi, but it's really a haunted house movie. When the, the, the ghost being a, gi a giant monster that's going to like eat your face off. Um <laughs> Those are the ones I recommend so objectively. Subjectively, watch Near Dark. Watch Pumpkinhead. I love Pumpkinhead. Pumpkinhead um, is good. 
Watch some foreign films. Watch Dario Argento's, Argento's Suspiria. Dario Argento is amazing, and Suspiria is, an, is a classic. It, it, cinematically, it's it's brilliant. And although the story doesn't always make sense, it doesn't have to because you get exactly what the hell's going on based off the mood, the theme, and how scary it is. That right. th- th- those are my recommendations off the bat that I would throw out there. Near Dark's great, best vampire movie. I one of the best vampire movies I've seen. They never say the word vampire. No fangs, but it's a vampire. <laughs> and we're fixing- and we're trying to put together a vampire show. So um, love it. Um, I'm going to throw something out there. The Shining, which is my go-to when I talk to people about this, which classic. it's a classic. But what I've talked about over the years is me being a skeptical paranormal person and, and a person that loves horror movies. And the better half here, when we go to Netflix for the last, you know, five, six years, anytime. I'm in that category. And she's like, really another one? And I'm like, well, you know, let's, let's see what we can find. So it's give and take. Um, the reason I go to that one so much when I talk to people is, is that as I watched that one, it brought me in because that could really happen. So many of the horror movies that I've watched in the past, you know, Freddy Krueger, the Halloweens and things like that. Nobody called the cops, a, a, a logical skeptical person is going to turn around and go, you know, it's an entertaining movie, but, it probably is not going to happen in real life. I'm not going to say that I don't love those movies. I like them. But what I love is the movies that basically get into your mind, take you into another place and say, this could actually happen with the shining. You're talking about a man that went insane. Yep. A lot of possibilities there. Tell me your thoughts on some of the movies that you've seen and the people that produce these type of movies. And what's the difference? I'm sorry, what's the question? Basically, what is the difference in some of the movies that you have seen over the years, some of the ones that basically can get into your mind versus just being a quality Friday the 13th, Halloween type movie situation like that? God, Halloween got into my mind. That ending was scary. <laughs> is well, he the movie I, man? Yes, he was. And he disappears after he got shot and stabbed and fell out of a freaking window. That's horrifying. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> What, uh, gosh, what may, uh, it's, uh, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, but it sounds like you're asking me what makes a movie stick in your mind. In other words, yeah, the mental type thrillers versus just the shock type, you know, yeah, the psychological is more of a direction I'm going, which is probably more in the line what holds my attention. And I know a lot of my friends out there versus just the, Blood and guts, you know, um, we're going to give it to him. Nobody called the cops. This God, probably yeah. wouldn't happen in real life. Well, I'll, I got a couple things to say about that. First of all, I'll tell you a theory I have about filmmaking because I make movies myself. And that's uh, blood and guts are a tool for a filmmaker. It's like a like a screwdriver or a, um, a, a, a nail file. You use it for one of two reasons. You use blood and guts to either raise the stakes of a scenario like, you can have a conversation with me, and out of nowhere, I pull out a knife and I cut you. That raises the stakes of what the hell is going on in this scene. That should, that's not supposed to happen. Right. Or you create humor. And I go back to Evil Dead because it's so gratuitous, it becomes comical. Like, the walls are ble- it Like, literally, it's just so much, like, blood, like, like it, trauma movies, like uh, Lloyd Kaufman's Toxic Campy. Avenger. Campy. Campy. It becomes campy. It's a joke. Yeah, the, the argument could be said with uh, Robert Rodriguez. Robert Rodriguez just absolutely used the blood and guts, and, and it worked for his show, for his movies. And Yeah, and, and it's a tool. You use it as a cinematic tool for filmmaking. And I think a lot of fil- young filmmakers especially, uh, they don't understand that blood and guts doesn't equate to horror. It more often than not equates to queasiness. And if that's the mood you're looking to create, then you use it. Uh, if you're looking to raise stakes, you use it subtly. And I think that's how you create the stakes by doing a subtle move. That's like, wow, you're, human beings aren't supposed to cut each other. That That's scary. But a lot of people think, oh, let's put more blood and that makes a horror movie. It doesn't. What makes a horror movie is something that really freaks people out. And I'll tell you what really freaks people out. At least what I think freaks people out. When you think you're in the total control of a situation, and by the time you realize you're not, there's nothing you can do about it. That's what I think horror is, at least for me. 
So when I make a horror movie, I'm always thinking the moment something scary happens, they it's it, it was already over 20 minutes prior. Like they were already dead 20 minutes prior. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no control. They have absolute a complete loss of control of the main character. That's horrifying. And we all feel it every day. We all make mistakes in life. And we realize, oh, shit, I should have done this 20, 20 minutes ago or yesterday. And I and it's over. You know, you ruined it. You try to salvage it, but you can't. That's real life horror. And you, you use horror stories like that to, to amplify that feeling. Um, I think that's what makes movies horrific. I, th I think like one of the, my favorite directors, Hitchcock, had a technique that no one had done before where he would literally let the audience in on what was going on and not the characters. And he explained it at some point that the moviegoers see someone place a bomb under the table and the two actors are talking. He said, well, they're talking about baseball, but the audience knows there's a bomb under the table and they're like there's a bomb stop talking about baseball it's going to blow up and it was an, it was absolute genius you know and it was something that no one had ever thought of before and you know that's to me that's kind of the psychology that you can play with in those things that's an example of a, of a tool a filmmaker tool mm -hmm. uh giving the audience information that the main character doesn't have that creates suspense the output of that is suspenseful because you know something's going to happen and the main character is not armed with that information, so they walk in blindly. Right. That's a very good example of what creates suspense and horror in certain circumstances. A horrific right. example is um, actually one of my favorite examples of a horror movie utilizing the, the thing I was talking about earlier um, was uh, When a Stranger Calls, if you remember that movie. Yes. When the, the babysitter is saying, have you, keeps caught, gets got, getting a phone call from a mysterious voice saying, have you checked the children? And it turns out the call's coming from inside the house. Is that Carol Kane, by the way? That yes, was in it's that? Carol Kane. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, I remember that. That scared the shit out of me. That's an example <laughs> of by the time you realize what's going on, it's already too late. Too late. The weird stuff is happening. You're like, oh, I, I'm totally in control of the situation. But when you realize the call's coming from inside the house, you were never in control in the first place. Well, and the thing was, Matt, that was, again, that was the first of those type of movies. The call is coming from in the house. It's become yep. cliche now, but it's the first time you saw it, and it was brilliant. You know, and it's like, okay, this is something you can almost you can empathize with that person on some level it's based on an urban legend no. and urban legends are horror yeah. stories they're warning stories that's the essence of a horror movie it's meant to be a warning for you to sharpen you up and become better in life um that's another reason why horror is attractive weirdly enough because it makes you face difficult situations that make you ultimately stronger at least theoretically um, that's also why I like Urban Legends, and that's also the energy of the show we did. We actually won a Telly Award for Haunted Routes because we made a, an Urban Legends segment about an Ojai ghost story called The Char Man and talked right. about the various different versions of that same story about a, a man who was burnt to, alive. And if you go to the Camp Comfort area in Ojai at night and you pull it, park your car and get out of the car, the Char Man will get you and will skin you alive. That's the essence of the story. Um, there's variations on what happens, the circumstances of how he'll get you, and um, <clears throat> it's fascinating to me how these urban legends are started, and you know how they're told around a campfire as if they're true. But what a stranger calls is based off of one of those classic urban legend stories. It's awesome. Yeah, there's so many of them. It seems like every state has a variation on them. Yeah, hey, but our our good friend Jay Blunty. Out in L.A. wants to know, how does Matt feel about horror comedy like Scream? It's awesome. I mean, uh, horror comedies, horror and comedy are, are great genres to blend together. They are two sides of the same coin because they throw you off of your game one way or another. Comedy diffuses a situation. Horror increases the, tense, the intensity of a situation. And you use one as a tool to create the punchline for the other. Mm-hmm. A, comic, a comical situation 
can uh, ease your your tension, and out of nowhere, bam, you scare the shit out of the audience. You can. Or vice versa, and then you make them laugh. Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2 is a perfect example of that. It's one of the best examples. Gremlins is an example. Um, uh, Ghost, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, you're right. Yeah. You know, the one of the best comedies ever made, you know? I mean... Going God. back to the old Abbott and Costello meet, the Universal Monsters, and uh, one time. of one of my favorites actually was Ghost Breakers. Yeah, Bob, Bob Hope is it, it's one of the funniest movies to this day I've ever seen. Classic, and yeah, I love yeah. Abbott and Costello. It's a great example. They were frick- Co- horror has always been comical, though. I mean, I guess the more you get exposed to horror, the more funny it gets. At least that's for me. Um, I'm at the point now where things like movies don't scare me, and they make me laugh more often than not, or they thrill me. Um, what scares me is the homeless guy with a knife in that dark alley. You know, that's that's really the scary shit in life. Yeah. Well, I, I, I and the question I was because there's two things that were coming to mind while we were talking. Number one, our guest last week that we had on Matt was uh, Andrea Perrin of the uh, Perrin family, uh, based in the country, and also my co-author for In a Flicker. And we've had multiple discussions about uh, the movie and director James Wan's interpretation of what happened in that home. And to me, one of the most brilliant things he ever did. Is that right? I'm sorry? Yeah, The Conjuring, is that what you're referring to? The Conjuring, right. And uh, the one segment where the girls were up in the bedroom and the one girl is swearing she's seeing a shadow behind the door, her sister standing there, and he just let the audience's imagination run wild because there was no special effects, nothing. It was just darkness. So you're trying to anticipate seeing a hand come out of something, and I thought that was brilliant because that was suspense. But the question I wanted to go with was Oren Pelly and Paranormal Activity, uh, I think kind of started something that has kind of frustrated us in the field now, and that is the manipulation of evidence for the paranormal. Does it frustrate you being somebody who's delved into film? Uh, that's actually where your profession is, but also delved into the paranormal that there are people out there that are regularly, and whether you see it on Paranormal Caught on camera or you see it on YouTube, that are regularly, masterfully faking evidence, whether it's UFO spots or or spotting or Bigfoot or things going on in their home. Does it frustrate you being part of the paranormal side of this, uh, that, that they're doing this? And do you also look at it from an artist and say, that's really clever how they did that? doesn't frustrate me it doesn't frustrate me as much as it frustrates me that people believe it i i I, i'm more frustrated by people who refuse to look at things from a critical open-minded eye i i I rather commend an artist for or a showman for creating a gaff or a man-eating chicken than a fool who will believe it um not to say I, I, I look down on people. I, I get fooled all the time, constantly in life. We all do. But I have, it doesn't bother me, and I'll tell you why. Um, I don't think in this day and age we can prove the way we want to, the way we are doing it, that ghosts are real because it's so easy to manipulate evidence. I think if we're going to prove that ghosts are real, it's going to be a very, in a very controlled environment um, in a way that is so blatant that there's no question. And unfortunately, the nature of paranormal investigating makes makes any skeptic question anything, everything. Um, there's a lot of fascinating stuff. And frankly, when I look at other people's evidence, I always, always, always take them at their word. Unless I have reason to believe otherwise. For example, if somebody I know is known to be um, a, a, a con man, I'm not going to believe their evidence, no matter what they show me. But if somebody swears me to me that they caught this evidence, and I've seen some pretty crazy shit on camera that I can't explain, I'm inclined to believe them. I'm also inclined to, to, to think it could be anything, including paranormal, but... I don't know, man. There's been people faking evidence since the history of evidence. I mean, and I'm not talking cameras. I mean, Bigfoot feet and like the Loch Ness monster was a toy boat with with a paper neck or whatever, you know, like 
it's it's in our nature to sensationalize and tell stories one way or another. And I look at it as a creative way to tell a story. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. It's funny how you got into this with um, uh, shockfilmfest.com is the website to go to. Uh, and our guest tonight, uh, Matt uh, Rosvalli. I, you know, when I got into the paranormal field, one of the reasons why is because when I was a kid, I used to get the big into Fangoria magazine. Well, thank you. Classic. And, and the reason why is I wanted to see how they did the special effects. I wanted to see, and it was all showing the gore, but how they actually did it. And so in the paranormal, I wanted to figure out why things worked the way that they worked. Yep. Um, have you employed that kind of a th an aspect when it comes to the human psyche? When you're making your films, which, by the way, uh, uh, many of them, if not all of them, are available on Amazon. So those of you who have Amazon Prime, you can definitely check them out. Uh, when you're going through the aspect of the filmmaking, are, are you looking at the paranormal side or the believer side of the paranormal, how to get them drawn in and then shock them at that next moment, that, that very intense moment for them? I think you have to be in tune with your audience to make a captivating movie. So yes, I'm always trying to think about what's going to be the thing that universally people can gravitate to and uh, be moved by. I think any good artist who is not doing it as a hobby has to do that. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you're making something for people to enjoy, to experience, to, 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 to witness, to be part of. And anything else is ultimately going to be masturbatory. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all do it. But All if right. you're working, if you're making a movie to, for people, you know, to consume, you need to make sure, think, you need to be thinking, what is something that people are really going to be moved by? So you have to, by the way, you said something interesting about how you got into paranormal because uh, you were always fascinated to see, you know, to learn how it works. And that's right. what got me into it. Right. And I think one of the most eye-opening books that I ever read was Will's Story versus the Supernatural where he talks about his journey meeting paranormal investigators and learning and becoming an expert only to find that all the experts he met were contradictory to each other. And he takes you on that journey as if in time you're with him. So he becomes an expert and then out of nowhere learns a piece of evidence. Oh shit, none of this was accurate. I have to reevaluate. Indeed, exactly, exactly. Uh, I love the genre of film that uh, you're involved with, and uh, I'm definitely going to look to uh, Amazon Prime, which I have, to uh, watch those films. I'm excited about that. Uh, but right now, we need to turn it over to Mr. Ken DaCosta at this time. Ken? Hello again, Matt. We, uh, we want to wrap this up with uh, a little something we call Seven Deadly Questions With, where we throw seven questions in rapid fire at you randomly from a number of topics, some near and dear to your heart, and some near and dear to your heart. So that's going to come up right now. All right, Matt Rosvalli, here you go with question number one. If you were any species other than human, including mythical ones, what would you want to be and why? Oh, gosh, probably a leprechaun. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, they, they literally can just appear. They got, they got all the powers, man. Leprechauns are awesome. Yeah. All right, question number two. Rank these iconic horror film villains. Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, and Michael Myers. I personally really like Freddy a lot. Um, I, I like all of them, but I'll, I'll put Michael Myers next because I think his movie is probably one of the best horror movies I've ever seen, objectively, again. Uh, disappointed I didn't say that earlier. Uh, Jason's number three, not because he's any he's bad, but I process of elimination, I have to put him in number three. Okay. Question three. In your appearance... In your opinion, what is the scariest movie of all time? And it doesn't have to be a horror movie either. 
Scariest movie of all time is weirdly one of the most boring movies of all time. And that's the TV series movie Salem's Lot. There was something horrifying about that vampire. The noise it makes, the makeup, and the, the way it moves. Very unnatural and very uncanny valley. It, it, it's disturbing. And when I say it's boring, it's like four hours of a lot of nothing. And then when that vampire comes on, to this day, scares the shit out of me. So, Well, to me, in that movie, it was the brother appearing, floating at the window. It's horrifying. And, I love that. And, and when he's out there, you know, let me in, let me in. And you figure it's like something is going to stop the kid from opening the window. But he doesn't. Nope. He opens it up and gets bit in the neck. I mean, yep. that was like, how the hell old was I? 18? Whenever that came out, and I was like, holy <clears throat> shit, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. All right, question number five. If you possessed a time machine, would you choose to go forward or backward in time? Uh, definitely forward. I, I want to avoid uh, diseases that there are no cures for. Um, and there were a lot of those back in the day. And I'd rather go in a time where technology is better. Yeah, 2,500 or something like that. We should be done with this by then. Uh, question five. Greatest horror film director of all time? Oh, it's hard. Um Gosh, John Carpenter's up there. He's he, he's awesome. I mean, I've got subjective answers. I'm a big fan of James Whale, but I mean, he's more of like a he's not necessarily a horror. He's, he made Frankenstein, yeah. the old dark house. Right. But John Carpenter's tops. I mean, the thing, the fog, come on, the fog, Halloween. The fog. I honestly thought was a better movie than Halloween. My my oh, own. Great. Personal oh, opinion. By the way, this uh, off topic. I'm drinking Polar. Uh, the, the you're a New Englander. You might recognize the seltzer. I got you. I yeah, got yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Love this stuff. I, I got you. As soon as you put it down, I just cl catch enough of a glimpse of that. Uh, right. not, they don't pay me. I just love them. <laughs> Question six: Best place in New York to grab lunch? Oh God! There's an Indian restaurant in the East Village on. Uh, Fifth and Sixth and First Avenue called Milan. There are four Indian restaurants, two uh, going up the stairs and two going down. And the manager stand outside and they'll physically grab you and fight for you because they're <laughs> competing with each other. And they're all Indian restaurants. But the one on the far left, top left, Milan is the best. Best. Get the lamb tandoori. It's amazing. Milan in New York. Remember that. And our final Catch question. Which is the better Bruce Campbell movie, Evil Dead or Bubba Hotep? I personally prefer Evil Dead. Sorry, it's not as interesting of an answer, but I prefer Evil Dead. Now, I was hoping for the upset. You know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I like Bubba Hotep. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I just think Evil Dead's better. I, I am pro, <clears throat> tend to like Army of Darkness you know, whatever, for whatever That's reason. But you can't go wrong. It took me a little bit wrong. to get into, but when I got into it, I loved it. It was fun. Good, fun. good, bad. I'm the guy with the gun. Yeah, you know, <laughs> great lines, great makeup. It's hilarious. I love it. Matt Rosvalli, you are off the hot seat. Thank you. With that, I'm going to bring in the rest of the Motley crew here as we uh, start to sign off for the night. Personally, just uh, before George uh, wraps this up, Matt, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It is such a pleasure. I hope we can do this again real soon. I'd love that. Thank you for having me. I had a good time with you guys. Uh, it's our pleasure. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Shockfilmfest.com. You guys definitely want to check it out. A very quick question I had for you, Matt, also. Have other directors, writers come to you or just yourself? Have you been thinking about some sort of a film relating to this virus? feel like not only are there so many movies pre-COVID that are of, about this topic, but now it's like you can't escape it. Yeah, it it's so topical, and everybody's got a camera, so everybody can make a movie these days. And, you know, everyone's quarantined. Actually, we have a quarantine competition at Shockfest, and you can submit your movie to Shockfest to our quarantine competition. Um, the instructions are on the website, so uh, be sure to do so because we highlight your movies. And the winner of the quarantine competition gets a check for six hundred and sixty-six dollars. 
Fantastic. And, and uh, I mean, there are people out there that have high tech equipment, everything else like that. You'd even, if the idea is, is conceptually good, even if they're doing it off their iPhone, no big deal. Just as long as it's a great concept. It's better that way. The, the whole concept of the competition is what can you do under shoestring parameters where you're trapped in a house and you don't have a production crew? How creative can you be? Mr. Bowler. I I think the three of us we're gonna we're gonna do some kind of found footage. Go for it. We'd love to see it. It'd be awesome to have it. There we go. There we go. I would call it a Rhode Island witch project. (laughs) Fantastic. You leave my mother in law out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I appreciate you coming on with us tonight. Thank you so much uh, to you and your family. Please be safe and uh, stay healthy. Thank you, man. And uh, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, maybe around the time we're coming up in uh, the February time frame, we'll uh, uh, or or as we get closer to the event, we'd love to have you come back with us. That'd be absolutely. Awesome. All right, man. You take care. Thank you so much. Be Thank well, you. Matt. You too, man. Good seeing you. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. That does it for our Friday night show. Again, as I always tell you guys that are in the chat, hit that subscribe button. Also, the little thumbs up. Click on that, and the bell is a reminder for upcoming. Uh, um, if, upcoming shows and programming. And uh, I think, Ken, we've got something from uh, Lizzie Borden House we're going to be posting here pretty soon. Yeah, we're going to take a virtual tour through the Lizzie Borden uh, bed and breakfast, and we're going to be posting that up this week. Also, a reminder that there is, uh, we have an investigation video that we put on last week. It's uh, doing pretty well. Uh, it's actually my group, Rise Up's investigation of Lizzie Borden House that took place last year. Yeah. And uh, we think it's pretty entertaining, and uh, we've got some surprises in there, things we didn't expect. So uh, I think it'll be a nice companion piece with that. And uh, Mr. Bowler, you also have a few things in the works down in Dallas-Fort Worth, correct? I do. Haunted Hill House is uh, on the agenda. We're going to be going there in August. Not sure what the date is, but uh, we'll keep you guys informed. You just make sure whatever you do, you guys be safe out there for sure. Absolutely. Jay, Blum- first, guys. Jay, Jay Blumke, take care of yourself, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll talk to you uh, next Friday again. Uh, you've been watching Dead or Paranormal Resurrected on the Paranormal Channel and also on our Facebook page, Dead or Paranormal Resurrected. Thanks so much, guys. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>